Hanan Ashrawi joins us from the Al Jazeera Bureau in Ramallah. Hanan, thank you so much for joining us on Upfront. Thank you, Mark. It's good to be with you. Israel's assault on Gaza continues to cause mass devastation and a mounting uh, humanitarian crisis. Uh, in fact, the World Food Program's deputy director said that nine out of ten people in Gaza are not eating every day, and half, half, are starving. But last week, the United States stood alone and vetoed a U.N. Security Council resolution that called for a humanitarian ceasefire. Despite overwhelming support for it by other countries, the U.S. deputy ambassador to the United Nations told the council that the veto was against a, quote, imbalanced resolution that was divorced from reality, also saying that it would not move, quote, the needle forward on the ground in any concrete way. What is your reaction to that? Well, I don't know whether I can take that seriously or not. It's act actually, it's preposterous. You can't imagine that a grown, intelligent human being can say these things with a straight face. If anybody is divorced from reality, it's the U.S. administration. It is Biden and Blinken and their spokespeople who are parroting such hollow, meaningless, ridiculous terms that are exposing their own loss of contact with reality. If you cannot see the tens of thousands of people killed under the rubble or uh, uh, wounded or starving, or suffering from horrific diseases, or children who have all sorts of uh, digestive problems because they're drinking seawater or contaminated water, uh, or people who are going not knowing where they are, not knowing where their families are. It's incredible the, the dimensions, the proportions of the horror that is unfolding before our eyes are unconscionable, are unfathomable. I can tell you we cannot even, you know, uh, think of, of all these things at once. And yet you have these people sitting there nicely talking about giving Israel more time, voting against a ceasefire, for heaven's sake, a ceasefire. Stop killing innocent civilians. Stop killing men, women, and children. Stop obliterating whole families. Stop destroying everything that can sustain and maintain life, whether it's their homes, neighborhoods, infrastructure, water, bakeries, hospitals, schools, universities. Everything is being destroyed systematically and with glee. And you sit back and you talk about this being divorced from reality. What happened to... I mean, really, there is something quite astounding in the way they lost touch with reality, absolutely. And they lost touch with any sense of decency or morality. How, how isolated is the United States at this point uh, in this position? I ask that because this week uh, the U.N. General Assembly voted on a resolution calling for a full and immediate ceasefire. It passed with 153 votes. Has the international community changed its, its disposition toward this? Yes, yes, clearly. There are no two ways about it. The uh, world public opinion is shifting. Um, countries in the world, states, even those who at the beginning, you know, jumped with the American uh, instant position uh, of maligning the Palestinians and declaring that we're liars or we're uh, terrorists or whatever, uh, now they are beginning to see reality as it is. And at least some of them are motivated by uh, a sense of humanity and decency by saying, no, this has to stop. Now, the U.S. refused the ceasefire consistently. It's not the first time it uses the veto. They called for what they said, temporary pauses, to bring in some food aid, some uh, aid, and then to resume. This is absolutely ridiculous, and this is inhuman. You're, of course, in the West Bank. You're in Ramallah right now, again, from the Al Jazeera uh, Bureau. Uh, and detentions have been a consistent issue in the West Bank. Uh, however, Human Rights Watch noted a substantial increase in the number of Palestinians who have been arrested by Israeli authorities since October 7th. More than 3,000 people, including minors, have been arrested or placed under administrative detention since then, uh, which brings the total number of Palestinians imprisoned to more than 7,000. Uh, in your view, uh, what is the reason behind this increase? Well, actually, since this year, since the... Uh, uh this uh, extremist, racist, right-wing coalition in Israel took over, they have been escalating, not just in, in uh, 
uh, land theft, not just in house demolitions and so on, but in raids in, in uh, villages and towns, in carrying out a full ethnic cleansing in the West Bank. And as you rightfully said, there are hundreds, uh, now thousands, of course, of uh, Palestinians who have been detained under the colonial uh, administrative detention system in which people are detained without evidence, without trial, without a hearing, without charges, without any kind of defense. So it is a, a way of exercising control. It's a way of, again, uh, getting more and more cards in this game that they're playing in order to say, well, look, we've exchanged one for one or whatever. They have now close to 8,000 prisoners in, in, or, or detainees in Israeli jails, and they want to use them for exchange. Well, they could have prevented uh, this escalation and this horror that we're going by agreeing a full exchange of prisoners, hostages, or detainees, by saying, OK, this statement all for all, release our captives, we will release your captives. What, I'm thinking about the consequences of these conditions uh, in light of any vision of future negotiations. You're talking about thousands of people imprisoned. You're talking about 18,000 people dead, according to Gaza's health ministry, since uh, October 7th. As you mentioned, lots of stuff happened before October 7th that we also have to take seriously. In light of hunger, in light of incarceration, in light of mass death, in light of all of this stuff, uh, how do you think about future negotiations with Israel? What's the calculus moving forward now? What's possible? I think talking about negotiations is really not only unrealistic, it is really an insult to the suffering and pain of people. From the beginning, we kept talking about, you know, not being able to have negotiations in a situation of asymmetry. There is a total lack of balance. An occupied people cannot negotiate with their occupiers. We kept telling people that because the occupying power has uh, influence and has power over the occupied who have no rights whatsoever. So you cannot ask uh, a people under occupation to ask their occupier for permission to be free. Not only don't they want us to be free, as a settler colonial system, they want to take our land without the people. And they want to maintain the system of, of control and inf willful infliction of pain. And now Netanyahu and his government, they say this openly, there can be no negotiations, there can be no Palestinian state, no sovereignty. We do not accept any of these Palestinian leaders, whether they're Hamas or Fatah or anybody else. Now they're saying something very serious. They're talking about the Palestinian police and security as being also the enemy. So they're preparing the grounds for an escalation in the West Bank. And of course, they have totally destroyed Gaza. So who's going to negotiate what with whom? I think it's the responsibility of the international community to end the carnage, to end the siege of Gaza and the West Bank, to end the occupation. And then you can talk about peace based on international law and the recognition of Palestinian rights as equal people who deserve their rights, their freedom, their dignity, their right to self-determination, and not as second or third class citizens in uh, an apartheid state that is trying to superimpose greater Israel on all of historical Palestine. It's not going to work. And to talk about peace negotiations is just absurd at this present moment. You talk about the world community watching all of this happen. Uh, over the last few years, uh, it's been shown that youth opinion, particularly in the West, has shifted toward a more sympathetic view of Palestine. Even former Israeli Prime Minister Ehud Barak expressed concern over this change. He told Politico, uh, quote, listen to the public tone. We are losing public opinion in Europe. Are you seeing that shift? And does that give you any hope for a different kind of future and a different kind of political reality? Absolutely, because for decades, for years, Israel had the full sway, <clears throat> the full power to shape public discourse. It had its own uh, uh, pro propaganda machines. It has its own influence, uh, especially in mainstream media. Um, and, and the Israeli narrative and the Israeli version was constantly the dominant one, and the Palestinians were either invisible or silenced or maligned and, and labeled. 
uh, and so on. Gradually now, with, of course, with social media and with access to information and knowledge, and with the ability to network and understand, and with the South also speaking out, because the global South now is becoming more vocal. The sort of dominant white European Christian mentality is no longer the, the uh, ruler of the world, so to speak. And now throughout the West, the people are rising. The people are, are understanding the nature of the Palestinian cause, the fact that we are uh, an indigenous people being uh, erased, so to speak, and denied and oppressed by a colonial power, because to us Israel is, a is an offshoot of colonialism. Uh, and uh, they are beginning to speak out, and they've refused to listen to their own governments. They've challenged their own governments, as you saw in London and Paris and different places. The younger generations are questioning, are asking, are seeking facts and knowledge, and are reaching out. And this is what gives them power, that they are not easily intimidated, and they are seeking uh, their own voice, and they're seeking partnerships and networks. And that's what makes a difference now. Dr. Hanan Ashrawi, thank you so much for joining us on Upfront. Thank you, Mark. It's good to be with you.